Get Advisor Fit with Olivia Looper, a series of interviews with financial consultants and industry experts helping financial advisors strategize, market, and grow their business using core fitness values and analogies. Do something today that your future self will thank you for with Get Advisor Fit. Here's your host, Olivia Looper. Welcome to Get Advisor Fit. Everybody, this is Brian Looper with Olivia Looper. Yes, we have How the did that same happen? name. No, he's not my husband. Uh, he is, however, my brother-in-law. He is my husband's brother. Um, and they're the only two children. So it's just them two growing up, you know, super close brothers and all that fun. Um, here we are working in the same industry. No, that was not an accident. Um, Brian is the uh, partner for the strategic implementer with his stepmother, and obviously my husband's stepmother, Ginny. So him and Ginny run the strategic implementer. She helped me um, choose the financial services industry to hone my writing and marketing skills into. So we are just here helping financial advisors do all the things, okay? All the things from the loopers, uh, high quality stuff. So, um, Brian, I don't want to talk the whole time. I don't want to give away all the good stuff. I know that inquiring minds want to know what is the strategic implementer? What do you guys do for financial advisors? Give us the 101, the rundown. So the strategic implementer has two main areas that we focus on with advisors and firms in general. We've got our ongoing consulting engagements, which we, we help firms with st strategic planning, obviously, execution of the strategic plan, um, accountability to make sure everybody actually gets things done. Um, staff development for not only bringing on new people, but getting them up to speed, training them, um, making sure they're going along their career path in the right way. We also help with sort of just day to day, week to week, month to month decision making. Um, we find that a lot of times advisors feel a little bit isolated in this industry because they don't get to talk to a lot of other advisors on a regular basis. They don't know what a lot of other advisors and firms are doing. And we help them you know, go through the decision-making process when it comes to potentially um, bringing on a, a new clients and you know, buying a new firm or selling part of their firm or big business decisions that they need to make that they may have trouble with. And the other main area that we help advisors and firms with is hiring. Um, we are not so much of a traditional recruiter. I like to consider us more of an outsource hiring manager which means we help with the whole process of hiring, beginning with uh, sort of writing an ad, interviewing people, making recommendations, um, assessments, um, job offers, the background checks, um, sort of the whole gamut of what the hiring process would be in maybe a, a larger firm. We take that off of the advisors in the firm and as much as we can and help bring on A players. We try to get the best people for our firms that we work with, and that's the only thing that we will that we'll take. So those are the two main areas that we work with advisors on. That's great. Um, I know that you guys have been talking a lot lately about uh, this really hard, weird, uh, exhausting to some degree, I'm, I'm imagining, um, hiring situation environment out there. Like what's going on? I mean, in your own words, like tell me what about what's happening. So I, I think it kind of starts before the pandemic. Um, the hiring market was, was pretty tough before the pandemic started. Um, we were finding a lot of advisors and firms, you know, we're having a hard time finding good people. Um, and the, the firms that we've been working with for many years, we've been telling them that you've got to pay good people well so that they're not stolen by other firms. And that's just a symptom of our industry, I think, um, you know, I think everybody that wants to hire someone from our industry, they want someone with industry experience, which means we have a very finite pool of people to work with. And when everybody wants that and everybody is trying to keep their good people by, you know, paying them well, it slowly starts to tick up and it becomes more and more difficult to entice good people away from their jobs. And then as the pandemic hit, everyone sort of, um, you know, cinched down and, and tried to, you know, I, I think everybody was a little bit nervous about making any kind of move, both employers yeah. and employees. And, you know, as that sort of developed and people kind of came out the other side of that, 
you know, that sort of in, un, unsureness or, you know, inability to make a move, that type of thing. And everybody realized that the economy was changing as far as remote work has gone and, and all of that. I think now it's even more difficult. The national unemployment rate is as low as it's been in quite a while. And uh, I think it's just gotten more and more difficult. I heard someone say recently, I don't know what the numbers are on this, but the unemployment rate in our industry might be close to one or two percent, which is just absurd. So that makes it be like um, the people who are looking to change jobs, not happy where they're at, not happy with their their work home, you know, hybrid balance or their compensation structure. I mean, you've got to have, I feel like as an advisor, that means you've got to have, have a lot on the table. I mean, you've got to have to have a lot to offer. So like if there was one thing or two things, even like that you say that these are the two things that advisors are lacking the most that's causing people to move or causing people to consider moving, what would those things be? Well, I would say, I, I, I want to kind of flip your question. I think the two okay. things that, that candidates are looking for um, is a benefit package that includes, you know, it's not all about money, especially for um, millennials and Gen Xers and Gen Zers too. Um, you know, it, it's the whole package of, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times we've gotten a great, we've worked with a great firm, great culture, um, but they only play, pay 50% of health insurance. And that's basically the only benefit that they have for their employees. And we just don't see a lot of candidates for jobs like that. If you don't, if you're not, if you're not, if you don't have competitive benefits, um, you're really going to suffer. And, you know, what I'm hearing a lot now is, you know, if, if there is no opportunity to work from home, even part-time, People have an issue with that because we obviously saw that it's possible. And when, you know, once you've seen that, I mean, I've been working from home for six years. You've been working from home for three or four years at least. Um, you know, once you've sort of seen the light of that, going back to being in the office 40, 50, 60 hours a week just doesn't make any sense. So if you're not even considering having part-time work from home opportunities, I think you're going to see a, a significant decrease in the number of candidates and the quality of candidates that you get. I cannot tell you how many times in my newsfeed, I mean, I would even venture to say per day, but let's say even every third day, an article in Bloomberg or Wall Street Journal or people are just quitting their jobs if, there's, if their bosses aren't letting them do a hybrid or work from home because they're like, it's not worth it. I'll find someone who does. And, you know, I was um, writing for another client recently, a fintech company. And um, one of the good points that I think, I mean, if you're an advisor who's hiring and things like this, I mean, to some degree, there's a lot. Of, I mean, you and I, we don't really have like if you have client facing things, you go see your clients. I really don't have client facing. You know, I only even have one client in the state where I work. So uh for me, it doesn't matter if my team is virtual or whatever. But the point that I was originally trying to make before I went down this rabbit hole was you're, like you said, there's a finite pool, right? So like if you're bound geographically too, I mean, and then, you know, so then there's, this is why I said this, but you got to juggle, you know, being able to have the person on your team and, you know, be able to meet with clients, but you know, maybe the, sometimes the candidate isn't where you are. So, you know, maybe you work out something that's like a half and half arrangement or like, you know, I don't know. I don't even know how that would work. I mean, but just seems like your pool is so much bigger when you allow for like a distance. And Yeah. I mean, it, it really is a factor of, um, you know, when, when you start to think about the idea of if you could have someone in a position to be permanently remote or partially remote, and it, it does make a big difference. I mean, somebody who's partially remote obviously still has to be in your same area. Yeah. Um, it could be a situation where, I mean, we, have, we do have firms that, um, you know, the, the firm is in the Midwest and they had someone who was in, a, in an advisor position and then the advisor moved to the Pacific Northwest. And the idea is over time that the advisor is going to come back um, and meet with clients in person, maybe over two or three week period. But I mean, that's probably the exception and not. Oh, the yeah, I would say this. So like with a, with a partial, uh, um, with a partially remote person, I mean, what the uh, what a lot of firms are doing is, you know, saying have three or four days working in the office per week, um, one or two days working remotely. And typically, 
uh, you know, it kind of goes back to the old, um, I think it was Dan Sullivan's model week where Mondays and Fridays, you don't typically have client meetings. Those are your prep days and your follow-up days. And so those would be perfect bookend days for somebody to work remotely. Whereas, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the person could be in the office. That's when you're going to have client meetings. That's when you may have clients coming into the office more. A lot of our clients, you know, they don't even have clients coming back into their office yet. So, and we have other clients that they never left the office. So it yeah, really that's, is that's so different, funny. you know, I mean, how, how you, the, the different parts of the country have responded to the pandemic. I mean, more in more rural areas, you know, they had so few cases of coronavirus that it was just like, well, you know, they wear masks for a little while and then it kind of just disappeared and it was never a big issue for them. Um, and so they've continued to have in, in-person meetings um, and it hasn't been a big issue for, you know, people that are in, you know, larger population era, areas, metro areas. I mean, those are very different scenarios. And I think with when you're thinking about whether it can be a partially remote person, that is a huge added benefit to a potential new hire. Um, that's something they want to see. That's something that is going to be a deal breaker uh, if they have the opportunity to do that. And they're not given that opportunity in a different job. But the big sort of pivot point is if the difference between having, you know, someone full time in the office versus part time in the office is a is a slight change. And you're definitely going to see an increase in candidates. But if okay. you can take that all the way to permanently remote, they never have to come to the office. Your hiring pool expands exponentially. exponentially. I mean, and, and I mean that literally we've seen we've hired uh, five or six permanently remote positions in the last year. And, you know, normally for like a client service associate or an associate advisor type of a position, even with a partially remote, we may see 80 to 100, maybe 150 candidates max for that type of a position. With a permanently remote position, we're seeing numbers like seven, 800, maybe a thousand applicants. That's so remarkable. we really get to have the cream of the crop. We get to pick the best of the best out of that pool of candidates. I mean, we're having people apply for positions we have a firm in the Bay Area that, um, you know, obviously the salary numbers there are ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, we told them, you know, if we can take what you were planning to pay for a certain hire and have it be permanently remote, we had people applying for client service associate positions out of, you know, lower cost of living areas like Birmingham, Alabama, or, you know, other areas in the South or in the Midwest that were CFP, CFAs, that they wanted to wow. do much lower level positions because the salary numbers were so high. Wow. We don't want to hire those people because I, yeah. I know they're going to be bored to tears. But what it meant was we could take the best of the best CSA and have them work permanently remote. And it has gone so well. I can't even tell you how much I, I advocate for this now. If it's a possibility that you can have a permanently remote person, it opens the door to what type of candidates you can get. Yeah. So that's that's exactly was my point. And, you know, I'm glad that you elucidated on that because, you know, in my mind, I don't know how all of these things work as far as how feasible it really would be. But I mean, going from 150 candidates to seven, 800 candidates, I mean, you're you're just like you said, you're getting the cream of the crop. So I guess you got to have it on both sides. Right. If you want to get the best of the best, you got to be off, be able to, you know, put some things on the table that you might not have been able to before. So. It's definitely interesting, but yeah, I mean, a lot of our clients just to they're concerned that they're not going to receive the same client service level um, with somebody who's permanently remote. And I don't think that's the case, um, even with people who are permanently remote, if they are, you know, sort of the cream of the crop, they have that client service mentality. They have they're, they're excellent at what they do. They are going to sustain a very high level of client service that you know, I, it, it almost has no effect on the level of client service, it, 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 even if it, it goes more, it goes higher because you're getting such a high touch, high level. And they have the ability to, you know, they have the ability to work from home full time, which means they don't have the commute. They don't have a lot of the frustrations. And as long as the communication level is high with remote people and the training level is high at the beginning of the hire, I mean, we've seen it go really, really well multiple times. We haven't had a bad one yet. Fingers crossed. Not going. I think that's going to be really interesting for advisors to hear, to be honest with you. Um, I'm glad that you shared that. I'm glad we got into that. It wasn't on the questions, but definitely seemed like something, you know, of, of interest. Um, 
So uh, really quickly, though, I want to talk a little bit more about you, too. I mean, we're going to still talk about strategic implementer, but um, I'm interested in you are in, in Esquire, correct? That's correct. Yes. You went to law school. Recovering attorney. A recovering it's a, it's attorney. A, it's a lifelong issue. I'm going to be recovering for the rest of my life. But oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. So um, how did you make the transition? What was your motivation? I mean, what was, um, you know, how did you how did you get here now? And um, what do you think that how do you think that shaped your experiences now doing this with a strategic implementer? So I, I went to law school in California um, and um, I've got some family out there. They're both lawyers. I was kind of, you know, chasing the dream of being a, a lawyer and owning my own practice, which I did pretty quickly out of law school. I started a law firm about six months after I, I graduated and took the bar exam, um, brought on a couple of people that I went to law school with as partners in the law firm and practiced law for about five years and slowly started to realize how much I hated it. Um, and at some point in that uh, in that period of time, uh, Ginny, uh, my stepmother, your stepmother-in-law, um, you know, basically just saw that how how miserable I was in this job and made me a maybe an offer and asked me if I wanted to come work for her. And then about I don't know, it took me a little, I'm a little bit hard headed. It took me about six or nine months to realize that that was a good idea. Yeah. And uh, you know, I was like, hey, is this still is this offer still good? And we started working together about six or seven years ago, I think. Um, and I moved out of Baton Rouge where she is now. And we worked together uh, in Baton Rouge for two or three years before I, I left Baton Rouge and moved up to Massachusetts with uh, my girlfriend. And um, it, it's really just been the best career change for me that I could have imagined. Um, I mean, one of the reasons I really disliked being a lawyer is just the how much on a daily basis there's just a contention. I, I realize that kind of sounds obvious um, being a lawyer and having, you know, uh, you know, having arguments with other lawyers. But uh, what I didn't see, I guess, before I got into the business and it, it took me a while to see even if I even after I got into the business was how personal a lot of uh, lawyers take the arguments um, and make it personal to them. And it just wasn't for me. I didn't like, uh, you know, either getting beat on or getting, you know, having to beat up on people on a, on a daily basis. I wanted to work in a business that, you know, was a little bit more friendly, which again, sounds obviously in hindsight, but it wasn't at the time. And I'm glad that uh, I sort of saw the light. And it's interesting now that I talk to other lawyers, um, you know, that either I went to law school with or, you know, just meet here and there. It's like, hey, you know, I practiced law for a while, realized I didn't like it and then got out. And the, what I always hear is, man, I wish I would have done that too. Like, yes. like everyone I talked to is like, I wish I had, you know, I had the guts to do that back then when I realized how much I hated it. And it's like, well, you can still do that. And they're like, wow, not now. I'm like, yes, you can still do it now. Yes, but now, actually. I don't know. It, it's hard to see the light, I think, for a lot of I, people, but I'm I glad I did. I think that's, um, it takes a lot of, I'm, this is going to sound corny, but like, courage to like say I'm not happy like this is what you know I've got to do something else and um, you're really good at what you do uh, from what I understand and that's not just coming from our family so um, I know you've been working on a series of videos that you're going to be sharing with your audience very soon cleverly titled the hiring range which I absolutely love definitely would not have been able to come up with that on my own um, very clever so I know, I think you just started putting them out. So this is going to, obviously this episode is probably not going to air for a few weeks, especially since I'm still in pre-production of this entire video cast. Um, so when this comes out, advisors, you'll be able to go to Brian's YouTube page and see all his cool videos that he's putting out. Um, tell us a little bit about the hiring range, what advisors can expect, what kind of stuff you got on there and uh, what they can do to, um, you know, use your content to help them. So I, I started the hiring range um, and we are going to be putting out the videos here pretty shortly. And the hiring range is a series of short videos of small little uh, snippets of things that I've learned over time in the hiring business over the last six to seven years. Um, I think in the last six to seven years, I've probably interviewed, I don't know, I'd ballpark 5,000 maybe people-ish. Um, and... I've learned a lot in that time. Um, and a lot of the videos are small things that I've seen from both advisors who have done this wrong and things that I've learned over time. 
things like what you're supposed to, when you, when you get a resume, let's say you have a job ad up and you get a resume or you get 50 resumes, what should you be looking for in a resume? Um, how do you decide what questions to ask in an interview? You know, a lot of times, uh, you know, you get into an interview and a lot of people just kind of, you know, go off the seat of their pants and, and come up with questions about either the job or what they think they're supposed to ask. And it should really be a more strategic way of looking at this. Of, you know, what questions should you ask? Why should you ask them? And what type of an answer are you looking for? And there are about, I don't know, a thousand books out there of uh, interview questions and, you know, different things that you should ask and strategies of interviews and all of this type of stuff. And I want to condense it down to a much shorter, you know, uh, content that people can can watch in, a, in maybe five ish minutes and say, OK, this is what you should be looking for. These are the types of things you should be thinking about when you decide what to ask in an interview. Um, another one of the areas that I want to cover is. You know, why, why does it seem like people cannot write a thank you email without having a typo? I, this is something that like baffles me and other people, but I'd say at least 50% of the time, maybe more closer to 60 or 70% of the time, you interview somebody, they write you a thank you email. It's great that they wrote you a thank you email. We always look for those, but there's a typo in them. What do we do with this information now? We're, we're sort of like, we've got a plus one and then a minus two, and we don't know what to do with this. And I, I, the entire philosophy behind the hiring range is to give advisors a little bit of information on specific parts of a hiring process that they can use to say, okay, this is in a nutshell what I should be doing, what I should be thinking about, so that they can then take, you know, a, a little bits and pieces along the way and construct their own hiring process. Yeah, no, that sounds awesome. Actually, like, I know that I saw some of your first videos that you recorded, and there's a whole psychology to it, right? So like you said, there's about a bazillion books out there that you could go get. First of all, they're probably generic for like, just hiring anybody not specific to financial services. So one thing, of course, that you've got there is that this is very niche specific, you're only hiring for advisory firms. Um, so you know exactly what to ask, you know exactly what to look for. And like you said, if you've interviewed 5000 people, I'm pretty sure you've got some stuff figured out by now. So um, that was really interesting for me to see when I watched your videos was this whole psychology that's behind the questions, the way the questions are asked, the the development of the questions from the first to the last, um, you know, how to exit the interview if it's just going terribly. Um, that quite things, a bit, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> things you didn't even think of, like, um, you know, I, like, I think one of them was you know, letting the candidate know if you're going to be out of town or something like that. Because, you know, if it's someone that you really is a as you're considering, but you don't want them to take a job somewhere else while you're going to be out or whatever. Um, these are things that, you know, you just wouldn't think of if you weren't hiring people every day. And I think, you know, that's where your secret sauce is at in what, why you're so good in doing what you do is that you've got it all figured out, you know, just from experience. I, I always, you know, it's something that, um, I, every time I think I have it all figured out, I learn something new. So not yet. And I hope never, it's not going to be exciting anymore, but We've got yeah. a lot figured out. So, and it's, it's one of those things that, you know, as soon as I, I, I feel like I've seen everything, I get surprised again. So that's always well, a good thing in any type of job, I think. If you were claiming that you knew everything now, we would all just call BS on it anyways. Well, who was it? It was so you, one of those Greek philosophers say, you know, you only know that you're doing well. If you, the more you learn, you realize the more you have to learn. So you're, that's, that's good. Definitely. Good answer. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'm excited about those videos for sure. Um, so, you know, just, um, from your perspective and, you know, I don't know how wide in scope, you, how, how closely you ever work with advisors in their own marketing, but, um, what kind of role do you think that content marketing in advisors, content marketing strategy, meaning their emails, what they put out on social media, um, you know, showing their company culture, plays not in attracting prospects because that's not really what you guys, I mean, you help with marketing side too and the business consultation side of strategic implementer, but um, in attracting top talent, like how important do you think that is for an advisory firm, um, you know, when in a candidate is checking them out? So I, I think it really depends. Well, 
from what I've seen, there are instances where we've worked with a firm that has a very specific um, either niche or uh, a very specific sort of ethos in the area that they work in. Uh, and one of the firms that we work with is a, a woman owned firm. They focus on women in transition as their niche and they have a very strong presence in ESG investments. Okay. And they also have a very strong uh, marketing content development. And the thing that we have seen is that if the message is clear and there is a lot of information about out there that a, that a, that a candidate or a, you know, somebody that they may be, that they may want to hire, if, if the candidate can go and look at this and sort of get the, you know, get the message that the firm is all about, get the, you know, the, the foundation of why the firm exists, those attract exactly the right types of people that they would be looking for to hire. It, it, it's almost like, you know, we can sift through a lot of the, the people that we would not want to hire or they self-select out. You know, they may not even apply for the job um, when the marketing messaging is clear and direct and well communicated. And then for the people who, you know, share that same, those same ideas, those same, you know, sort of uh, whether it be ethics or interests with the ESG investment type of a thing, the people that share those same, that, that same ideas, they are laser focused on this job and this job alone. And they, they see the ad, they see all the marketing content. You know, and they see sort of what, why the firm exists and, and all of that. And they want to work for this firm above all else. And that combined with what we were talking about earlier with a good benefits package and, and things like that. I mean, it really narrows the field down of candidates to have the specific people they want to hire applying for the job, which I think is it makes hiring for advisors easier. Yeah. So not only is the hiring easier and you're going to get a more qualified candidate, you're going to get a candidate who is more invested and you're going to get ultimately someone who's more engaged, which means more productivity, which means higher profitability. So you're going to if you have a clear marketing message, I hope everybody hears this. OK, not only are you going to get the best people to work for you, but the same thing is going to happen with your prospects. They're going to self select. If they are not into ESG investing, they think it's hogwash, they're going to go away. And you know what? You want them to because they don't care about what you're doing. And you don't want to deal with people who don't care about what you're doing or you're going to have to fight them the whole way. Yes, their money is green, but it's not worth it. So let them go along. Pass along to the next advisor. So same thing, uh, you know. If a business owner is looking for an advisor who works with business owners, I mean, they need to know when they go to your website, when they go to your social media, what it is that you do, who it is that you're serving. It just makes self-selection possible and it makes your your job. Ultimately, you're going to get that ideal client. You're going to get that ideal candidate. So it really works the same way. I'm really glad to have you confirm that. Um. So with these stories that we've gone over in mind, um, well, no, you, you just gave the advice, have clear messaging, that's it. Yeah, clearly articulated um, messaging about what your firm is, why it exists, and it, it will help you not only, like you said, not only with the people that you're trying to attract to hire, but with your, with your clients. I mean, this is something that we communicate with our consulting clients too. Is okay. that if you're trying to, you know, if your niche is everybody and their mother, you're not selecting for anything. And what, you know, what we've seen over and over and over again is the clearer your message about what your niche is, what, you know, who you're trying to attract and what area you are an expert in, yeah. the easier it's going to be to attract those specific types of people. If you don't have a niche, if your niche is everyone who's got $8, you're just not going to be it's you're, you're almost making the job of business development more difficult by not narrowing the field. And the same is true with hiring. If, if I can if I can go to your website and I have no idea who you're trying to attract, who your clients are, who you want to work with, why your firm exists. I don't really have anything to go on about why I would want to work with with that work for that firm. You, what makes you different? What, what, what makes me want to work here? You're just like. Everybody, I mean, if there's no clear messaging, there's no clear way to be attracted to it. It's kind of like, I mean, not the vanilla ice cream is bad, but if you're somebody who really likes Rocky Road and you're just looking, you know, at everything's vanilla, I mean, it's going to be pretty clear where you're going to go. And I mean, yeah. I think that's pretty true 
for, uh, you know, that's why there's so many different flavors of ice cream. You know, you know what I'm saying? So everybody has their own thing that they need. And, and you need to be specific about that. So, so many advisors are so afraid to say what they stand for and be who they are. And because they're afraid they're going to limit people out, what they're doing is limiting themselves out. You're literally pushing yourself into the background to just say, I don't want to stand out. I don't care to attract the type. I'm too scared. I'm too timid. Well, I'm no different than anybody else. So, you know, you're literally just pushing yourself back, camouflaging yourself with all the other advisors. So just something to keep in mind, you know, for everybody out there who's just a little scared. And if you're just a little scared, it's okay. Come on and hold your hand and we can do it together. We, we can make your messaging and we can come start from scratch and get where I mean, people are so there's jobs talking about job satisfaction. I mean, as an advisor running a firm or co-running a firm or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Um, just ultimately you're going to be happier. Yeah. hundred percent. I, I say, give it a shot, give it a shot. See what happens. If it doesn't it work. Good you, college try. There you go. I like it. All right, cool. I like it too. Um, so, Brian Looper. Yes, ma'am. When we talk about, I mean, so many, we thought, I think that we all thought we were in the clear here a few months ago and that this pandemic stuff was going to be coming, dwindling to some sort of end and things were reopening and then this Delta variant came and whatever. So who really knows what's going to happen? And like you said, different parts of the country, different things are happening. You're in Massachusetts. I'm in Florida. Jenny's in Louisiana. Uh, you know, we're all having different experiences. Um, but when we talk about next year, 2022, what are you looking forward to the most personally and also professionally? Um, I think uh, I, I would like to get back to conferences at some point. I know they've, they've had some uh, in-person conferences recently. Um, I'd like to be able to, um, you know, go to a conference, talk to people in person again. I think that's you know, I think that advisors believe that that's also a big thing with their clients. I like to talk to people, you know, I think you build a connection with your clients and, and that's true with the advisors and the firms that we work with. So I'd like to be able to, you know, see people in person again um, and, you know, sort of get back to that sort of community um, that uh, I think we're missing with the, a lot of the remote stuff. Um, and I think, uh, you know, with my hiring videos coming out, obviously I'm going to be a big YouTube celebrity. So I'm going to have to deal with the, the prices, the cost of fame coming up. <laughs> so, you know, it's going to be a tough year, but I'm going to get through it. Yeah. I think you'll be able to handle it. You were born to be a celebrity, Brian. God, I hope not. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. No, it's funny that you say that because, you know, so, so you know, lexicon's only, I guess, 18, nine, almost four years old. And in the beginning, Jenny was like, oh, conferences, conferences. And I was like, man, I was just like chugging along, like trying to build my business. You know, and I was like, I don't know, that seems like pretty far off. But now I'm finally to the place where I'm like, yes, I want to go to the conferences. I want to go meet people. I want to get out there. Partially this podcast and video cast like was seated in that because I feel like I want to be a bigger part of our industry and like get out there and have this community. I mean, obviously it's not the same as meeting in person. And I definitely am looking forward to that, but the, I mean, it's there. I think we're all really ready for, um, to get together and, you know, make those forge those relationships and things like that. So that'll be exciting. Hopefully we'll go to the same one so we can. We'll have to coordinate. Coordinate. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know, I, we, so obviously in the beginning of this, we talked about how Brian's brother is my husband. Well, Brian's brother is also my business partner. And uh, we've been working together now for about a year, I would say. Um, him full-time with Lexicon has been like six months now. And I think that I pretty much got him figured out. And I think we have a good balance, but if you had any advice, to give me and working with your brother going forward 24 hours a day, seven days a week, four feet across from each other in the same room, eight hours a day. What would it be? I will caveat this with, I have never worked with him. I have been forced to live with him. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, not of either of our own choosing. Um, I would say he secretly does love to dance. Uh, so if you can force him to dance, he'll be, he'll be much happier. That's not true. I'm, 
uh, he hates camping. <laughs> Um, I will say seriously, if all else fails, uh, homemade blueberry muffins solve a lot of problems for him. So, oh, yes, that sounds delightful. I, I think that I can eat them, but I would still like to smell them. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Be a that's, nice, like, that's the secret. Blue, okay. I'm gonna hold on. Blueberry muffins. Yes. Gotcha. Love it. Love it. All right. Brian, thank you so much for your time. I always love to talk to you. Hopefully we'll get together more here in the future, go to some conferences, shake things up. Um, advisors, I hope that you found this particularly helpful. Uh, if you want to hear more about Brian and Strategic Implementer, go to strategicimplementer.com, follow them on social media, and go to the YouTube channel, subscribe. Um, if you are you know need some help with your hiring, and... If you don't have, you know, 20 extra hours in your week, just call them up and see if they can help you out because hiring is no freaking joke, man. And um, I wouldn't want to do it. And I know when I get, you know, if I if I get to a place where I need a full timer, I know where I'm going. So um, thanks, guys, for joining us again. Brian, thank you for joining us. Thanks it was a great me. conversation. And um, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Get Advisor Fit with Olivia Looper. To learn more about Olivia and how her firm, Lexicon Content Development, can help you, visit lexicon.contentdevelopment.com. If you want to reach out to Olivia on LinkedIn, you can find her at Olivia Looper Lexicon. And if you'd like to follow Olivia on Instagram, you can find her at Lexicon Content Development. Till next time.